William Henry of Hanover was born on the 21st of August, 1765. He would go on to become the last king and penultimate monarch of the House of Hanover. He was the third son of George III and the younger brother of George IV. The Hanoverians had assumed the British throne in 1714 when George I inherited the crown after the death in that year of his mother, Sophia, and then his second cousin, Queen Anne. George I was Anne's closest living Protestant relative and became king under the terms of the Act of Settlement of 1701. In this talk, we will discover more about William's life, loves, naval controversies, legacy and visit to Plymouth and the people he met when he, when he came to town. Age 13, William began a career in the Royal Navy in June 1779, initially serving as a midshipman. His father sent William into the Navy to remove him from the influence of his elder brother, George, who was already annoying and opposing his father in the customary Hanoverian fashion. His naval career, which would later earn him the epithet the Sailor King, saw him see action at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1780. Although William was accompanied on board ship by a tutor, his duties were similar to those of his colleagues, including his share of the cooking. He was even arrested with his shipmates after a drunken brawl in Gibraltar, although he was quickly released when his identity became known. He saw service in New York during the American War of Independence, becoming the first member of the British royal family to set foot in what would become the United States. While serving in America, a plot to kidnap the future king was approved by George Washington, although it was never enacted as intelligence of the plan reached the British and William was assigned guards for his personal protection. After a break of two years in Hanover from 1783 to 85, completing his education, William returned to sea. In June 1785, he was promoted to lieutenant. He took command of HMS Pegasus, a 28-gun frigate, in April 1786, spending time in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Later that year, he was stationed in the West Indies under Horatio Nelson, the two becoming firm friends and nightly dining partners, with William giving away the bride at the Admiral's wedding on the island of Nevis on the 11th of March, 1787. When based at Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1788, commanding the frigate Andromeda, he fathered a son, William Henry Courtney. He was said by a friend serving in the same station to be perfectly acquainted with every house of a certain description in the town. William had ambitions to be elevated in status to a duke like his elder brothers. With George III reluctant to award him a title, he threatened to stand for election to the House of Commons in the Totnes constituency. Appalled by that prospect, George III made him the Duke of Clarence and St Andrews and Earl of Munster in May 1789, and he left the Navy the following year. With Britain at war with France again in 1793, William expected to be given a command but one was not forthcoming. Possible explanations for his exclusion include an arm broken after falling downstairs while drunk and his vacillating public expressions of opposition and support for the war. Although the Admiralty did not respond to his request to be returned to active service during the Napoleonic Wars, in 1798 he was appointed an Admiral, although the rank was only in name. In 1811, he was named Admiral of the Fleet, but again, it was a purely honorary position. The nearest he came to combat was in 1813, when visiting British troops fighting in the Low Countries. From a church steeple, he observed the bombardment of Antwerp and came under fire with a bullet piercing his coat. Between 1791 and 1811, he lived with his mistress, the actress Dorothea Bland, whose stage name was Mrs. Jordan. 
She was also known professionally as Dorothea Francis and Dorothea Jordan, informally as Dora Jordan. They met at Drury Lane and lived first at Clarence Lodge and later at Bushy House in Teddington. William and Dorothea had ten children, five sons and five daughters. Being born out of wedlock, they were known as the Fitz Clarences. On their separation, William had custody of their sons and Dorothea the daughters and an annual stipend on the proviso she didn't return to acting. Heavily in debt, Jordan returned to the stage and William took legal action and removed their remaining daughters from her care. Moving to France, she eventually died in ill health and poverty in 1816. However, marriage became a necessity for William. His eldest brother was acting as Prince Regent as George III's dementia worsened. And following the death of his niece, Princess Charlotte, who had been second in line to the British throne, William was nearing the top of the order of succession. His rising debts, recorded as £46,000 back in 1797, that's around £4.6 million today, required settlement through marriage. William, aged 52, married Princess Adelaide of saxe meiningen in July 1818. 25-year-old Adelaide, after whom the Australian city is named, allegedly improved his manners and finances, but crucially failed to produce an heir. Their first child lived for no more than a few hours, and the second, also a daughter, for only three months. There were also a number of miscarriages. In May 1827, William's, William was appointed Lord High Admiral by the new Prime Minister, George Canning, who held the role for a brief 119 days until his death from tuberculosis. It was the shortest reign of any British Prime Minister until Liz Truss's 50 days in 2022. It was the first time the position of Lord High Admiral had been occupied since 1709, Canning reinstating it to get around problems assembling his administration and as a nod to the Crown. William had ambition, sorry, Sorry, William proclaimed his appointment was by the gracious goodness of his majesty to the ancient and important office of Lord High Admiral and trusted his conduct in this situation, born from my professional knowledge, will be productive of advantage and improvement to the naval service of this country. William's powers were limited and would be a source of contention. He, would, he could act only with the consent of the High Admiral's Council, and at sea he would need their agreement unless accompanied by a council member. Sir George Coburn, the senior council member, apparently had even less intention of relaxing these restrictions than William had of obeying them. It was in his role as Lord High Admiral that William came to Devon in July of 1827 to inspect the Royal Dockyard at Devonport. Henry Wolcombe, principal founder of the Plymouth Institution, which is now known as the Plymouth Athenaeum, was deeply involved with this visit due to his civic positions. Wolcombe, a trained solicitor, was a freeman and then alderman of the town and was mayor from 1813 to 1814. He would go on to be appointed Recorder of Plymouth and was President of the Athenaeum at the time of the Royal Visit. It was a return to parts that William knew well. He had been stationed in Plymouth during the 1787-90 period when captain of HMS Pegasus and HMS Andromeda. He had lodgings in Ordnance Street, Devonport, and became a frequent visitor and friend of the Wynne family and dance partner of Sally Wynne, with whom it has been said he enjoyed a close friendship. William arrived on Monday the 9th of July. A lookout stationed on the Mewstone at 2am signalled sight of the lightning steamer, which was carrying the Duke. Around 4am, the lightning began to emerge from behind the Mewstone, casting a dense train of smoke. 
Towed by the royal sovereign, a mile beyond the Mewstone, she was given a 19-gun salute by the Dartmouth frigate, which was lying just off the eastern edge of the breakwater. According to the London Evening Standard, immense crowds hurried from all quarters towards the sea and along the heights and the shore. Anxious spectators, spectators were lined from the citadel to Mount Wise. They passed along the breakwater on both the southern and northern sides as William inspected the works taking place on the structure. When they passed near the Dartmouth, William was saluted with three cheers from the men on that vessel. Proceeding between the island, presumably Drake's, and the main, presumably again Firestone Bay and Devil's Point, vessels commenced firing, followed by three cheers as the yacht passed each one. The London, the London Evening Standard said, the crowds on shore with hats off and kerchiefs waving joined enthusiastically in the compliment, producing a chorus almost as deafening as that of the guns which had but just ceased. Reaching the mouth of the Hamoze, another salute of 19 guns came from the Mount Edgecombe battery and immediately the Britannia's barge went alongside bringing officers and dignitaries to receive the Duke. It wasn't until 7.30 p.m. that William disembarked on the Admiral's steps at Mount Wise. The front of the Admiral's house was decorated with variegated lamps representing the letter W surmounted by a crown. This seems to be the original Admiralty House, now known as Hamo's House, rather than Government House, which was renamed Admiralty House in 1934, or the Admiral's House in the Royal Naval Hospital. I hope that is all clear. The next day, William returned to inspect the breakwater on foot, meeting J. Whitby, the superintendent of works. From the breakwater, he proceeded to Bovisand Bay and visited the reservoir and watering place at Stadden Point, before visiting the quarries at Oriston, which supplied the stone for building the breakwater. At four o'clock, he proceeded to inspect the Vittling Yard, where he was received by the commissioner of the Vittling Board, Sir James Gordon. On Thursday, the 12th of July, William went to Marine, Pra Marine Parade, Stonehouse, to inspect the Plymouth Division of the Royal Marines. Received at the Admiral's Hard by Adjutant Graham and a Guard of Honour, he visited barrack rooms, offices and the infirmary. After lunch, William reviewed the Marines in light order on the hoe. According to the Morning Chronicle, more than 15,000 spectators, most fashionably dressed, were present and the day, though cloudless, was rendered free from excessive heat by refreshing sea breezes. William said the inspections had satisfied him of the efficiency, good conduct and high state of discipline of the Plymouth Division of Royal Marines. That evening at the Royal Hotel, which was located around the corner from the original Athenaeum building in George Street, William was entertained by the Plymouth Naval Club on the 26th anniversary of the Battle of Algeciras off Gibraltar. Dining on venison, turtle and every species of dainty and delicacy of wine and viands, William in his address discussed his naval service in Plymouth and how the town was greatly endeared to him and that as a naval port, Plymouth was his favoured spot. The evening mail reported William as saying, it is remarkable that Plymouth should be the first place out of London at which I have appeared in my public capacity. I have ever felt strong attachment to the port of Plymouth, an attachment which can never cease for with the name of Plymouth are associated all those recollections of early days which I must ever fondly cherish. I will therefore not hesitate to declare that I have heartfelt pleasure in recollecting the many happy hours of my life passed in Plymouth, and if I may be permitted to entertain partiality for one port above the others, Plymouth is that one. The host of pleasing reflections which were awakened by the scene as I came into the sound on Monday were rendered doubly dear to the reception which, I, which met me as I approached the shore, and I am bound to acknowledge I felt happy and proud on the occasion. 
On Friday the 13th of July, which fortunately didn't prove unlucky, William left his yacht, the Royal Sovereign, at 10 a.m. to inspect the Royalist, Medina, Weasel, Leverett, Harpy, Lyra and Vigilant. He then went up the Hamoes and inspected the Britannia, Ocean and Windsor Castle before returning to his yacht at 4.45. In the evening, with 300 people in attendance, he was back at the Royal Hotel for the address of the Mayor, Captain Richard Arthur RN, and Corporation. He was received and reminded of his association with the town in the welcoming address. In the revival of these early associations, we have one peculiarly our own, arising from the reflection that we have been allowed the honour for so many years of enrolling your highness's name as a member of our corporate body and we and that we have therefore the additional honor of receiving your royal highness as a brother freeman william responded and spoke again of his affection for plymouth in the former part of my life i had the pleasure of passing several years in this neighborhood and i may truly say that i look back on that period as comprising some of the happiest moments of my existence I am also exceedingly proud to say that Plymouth was the first borough of which I was made a freeman. I feel much gratified that my revered brother, our most gracious sovereign, has thought fit to appoint me to the high situation which I hold, inasmuch as I shall be enabled to manifest the deep interest which, as a freeman, freeman of your borough, and as an Englishman, I entertain for the construction and preservation of the great national works now carrying on at Plymouth. Those two great works then in progress were the construction of the breakwater and the Vittling Yard in Stonehouse, the latter of which came to be named after William. It was the major Vittling depot of the Royal Navy and an important adjunct of Devonport Dockyard. Designed by the architect Sir John Rennie, it was con constructed between 1825 and 1831. The yard consolidated in one place various victualling activities from around Plymouth, including the brewing of beer, the slaughtering of live animals for fresh meat, the manufacture of barrels, the baking of bread and biscuits, and the production of flour. It also provided space for administration, accommodation and large amounts of storage. However, no sooner had it been built than the intended function of the yard began to change. The abolition of the Navy beer ration in 1831 meant that beer was only ever brewed in very small quantities. And over time, for various reasons, including a rise in the use of tinned food, the yard came to be used increasingly for storage. In 1891, a significant section, including the brew house, cooperage and Clarence block, was converted into a Royal Naval Ordnance Depot. But the yard retained a role in provisioning Britain's Navy for a further century. William went on to dine that evening with the mayor and corporation and 87 guests, including the Earls of Morley, North Esk and Errol, and Colonel Fitzclarence, one of his illegitimate sons, Frederick. At the dinner, reported the evening mail, the mayor remarked that William had that day made a donation of £50, a little more than £4,000 today, to the charitable institutions of the borough. William's wife, Adelaide, later gave a donation of £20, with £5 for the poor box. William told his fellow freemen that it is impossible for me not to be interested in the welfare of Plymouth and anxious to promote its prosperity. By every Englishman, the importance of the port of Plymouth must be known and valued and connected as it is with all early recollections. I could not, on my return after long an absence, look upon it without feelings of deep interest and peculiar pleasure. He then proceeded to express his satisfaction at the progress of the works on the breakwater. Although noting that some of the plans adopted had not yet met with success, to the credit of those concerned, less error and less difficulty had occurred in that undertaking than any other work of the same magnitude in any part of the world. The works, he said, must be as beneficial to the country at large as to the town in which we are assembled.
He added it would complete one of the finest harbours in the world. He concluded by saying, I cannot express how deeply interested I feel in the prosperity of the populous, rich and flourishing town of Plymouth. The following day, William went to Cremel Point to inspect the progress of the works at the Vittling Yard. He laid the top stone of the sea wall under a salute from the ships and batteries and then visited the marine battery. According to the evening mail, having minutely examined these places and asked a variety of pertinent questions, he gave the workmen 10 guineas, around £900 today. Back on shore, he returned to the Admiral's house at Mount Wise to await the arrival of his wife, Adelaide. Accompanied by a Miss Fitzclarence, William's daughter, Amelia, Adelaide had made for Plymouth by land, arriving via Street and Exeter and proceeding on the 17th of, of July through Dawlish, Tynmouth, Torquay and Totnes. She crossed the new Lara Bridge accompanied by the Earl and Countess of Morley and a number of the nobility and gentry as a guard of honour from the Devonport Yeomanry Cavalry awaited. The evening mail reported the entire way from the bridge to the town was lined on either side with people forming a broad, unbroken and closely compacted hedge of human beings interspersed with horses and carriages and from the gaiety of the female apparel seeming to be in full blossom. The evening mail continued, at the boundary of the borough, a triumphal arch tastefully formed of evergreens and decorated with a variety of flags was thrown across the road and at the same place was posted a guard of honour consisting of the light company of the 9th Regiment with the drums and regimental colour commanded by Captain H. Coburn under the direction of the mayor. To this spot, the mayor and corporation, attended by the band of the South Devon militia, walked in procession with several flags displayed and followed by a long train of the most respectable inhabitants to greet Her Royal Highness on entering the borough. After God Save the King had been played, the mail reported some confusion occurred here in consequence of the desire of the people to take the horses from the carriage, which Her Royal Highness, being much alarmed by the extreme crowd and noise, was unwilling to accede to. However, the well-detected exertions of Lieutenant Colonel Bunbury of the 60th, who was in waiting with Sir John Cameron, soon restored order, and the Mayor, having assured Her Royal Highness that he would answer for her safety, Her Royal Highness consented to comply with the wishes of the people. The horses were accordingly taken from the carriage, and several stout Plymouthians took their place, as zealously as if resolved to show their loyalty, even should death be the consequence. The horses were restored to the carriage by the time the Devonport deputation uh, joined the process to Mount Wise, where another large and cheering gathering awaited. William and Adelaide then took the Admiral's barge under royal salute from all the ships in the harbour to Mount Edgecombe, where they spent the night. Receptions for various officers followed in the next couple of days in Devonport and a procession into the town through St Albans Street, Fore Street and Duke Street to the town hall was watched by a vast number of the inhabitants. During her time in the three towns, Adelaide would host a drawing room at Mount Edgecombe for receiving the ladies of captains and commanders in the Navy and of field officers of the Royal Marines. After enjoying a sightseeing, a sightseeing trip along the Tamar in the Lightning, a grand party was held at the Weirhead near Gunners Lake before the Royal Party left for two days at Saltram. On the 17th of July, William and his entourage came to the Athenaeum to hear one of its members, William Snow Harris, lecture on the subject of lightning conductors for ships. Henry Wolcombe's role in the royal visit may have helped to bring the Duke to the Athenaeum that day. The St James Chronicle and London Packet and New Lloyd's Evening Post recorded William's visit 
His Royal Highness, the Lord High Admiral, attended by the Earl of North Esk, Sir Thomas Byam Martin, Sir Edward Owen, Sir William Host, John Barrow, etc., visited the Athenaeum for the purpose of witnessing the experiments of our truly scientific townsman, Mr. William S. Harris, on the application of lightning conductors to ships. Soon after 11, His Royal Highness and suite were received at the gate by the president and officers of the institution, by whom they were conducted into the hall where the other members were assembled. Mr. Harris then proceeded to explain the principles upon which his improved conductors were constructed and demonstrated by experiments the decided superiority of fixed and permanent conductors over the movable ones now employed. From a powerful machine, he passed the electric fluid down the mast and through the keel of an elegant model of a ship of war floating in a large vessel filled with water to a boat at a distance from the ship. A portion of combustible powder placed around the mast and in the boat and simultaneously with the electric shock the powder in the boat exploded leaving that around the mast through which the fluid had passed by means of a conductor untouched thus proving in a manner clear to the simplest comprehension that a ship protected by these conductors would escape unhurt from the effects of the most violent thunderstorm. In a second experiment, he passed a similar shock through a mast two or three inches in diameter, protected like the former by a conductor, which remained uninjured, but another shock being passed through it, the conductor having been previously removed, it was immediately shivered to pieces. The Morning Chronicle takes over the report. The Lord High Admiral paid the most courteous and condescending attention to the experiments and illustrations brought forward by Mr. Harris and spoke from personal experience of the dangers to which ships are exposed from the effects of lightning and showed by the various questions he was pleased to put that he had entered most fully into the scientific details which he had been submitted to his notice. It was also pleasing to observe that the experiments and explanations were minutely attended to by the several able and scientific gentlemen in the Royal Highness's suite. After the experiment, the President, Henry Wolcombe Esquire, thanked His Royal Highness for condescending to honour the Plymouth Institution with his presence on that occasion, and alluded to the former proofs of royal favour and munificence which have adorned the walls of the Athenaeum with casts from the Elgin marbles, the present of His Most Gracious Majesty and concluded with stating briefly the general objects of the institution, in the furtherance of which he had pleasure to say many officers of the naval profession were associated. To this address, the, His Royal Highness was pleased to return a gracious answer and retired being attended to his carriage by the officers and members of the society. Reports of the royal visit to the Athenaeum even made it into the Dublin even mail and Wolcombe remarked in his journal that the visit to the Athenaeum on Tuesday last was very gratifying. Harris performed his experiments as usual with great clearness and dexterity and spoke unembarrassedly, unaffectedly. The Duke was attentive and understood the subject and I doubt not will have it tried in the Navy. Sir Edward Owen and Mr Barrow both came in and held some discussion with Harris, but I think Harris made good and presented all his statements. For all the success of Snow Harris's demonstration to William, due to a combination of admiralty failings and bizarre political machinations, it would not be until July 1842 that the order was finally given for all hulls in the Navy to be fitted with Snow Harris's system of lightning conductors. However, his system was later installed on the new Houses of Parliament Buckingham Palace and Queen Victoria's Isle of Wight residence, Osborne House. Despite the lengthy delay in adopting Snow Harris's system, the Plymouth Institution was proud of the royal visit. To commemorate the day, Henry Wolcombe commissioned John Ball to paint a picture of the event. 
The painting was finished in 1832 and first shown in the Athenaeum in 1833. It remained in Walcombe's possession, who passed it on to his nephew at Hemmerden following his death. In 1965, it was given by the Walcombe family to this society. It now hangs on the east wall of the Athenaeum lounge. Ball, the artist, a member of the Athenaeum, produced a unique record of the occasion. Unfortunately, he used bitumen in his paint, which has left, despite cleaning, several of those represented with black panda eyes. The picture, which has alas suffered, suffered significant deterioration since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, shows Snow Harris addressing the Duke suitably attired in naval uniform and pink sash surrounded by the most prominent members of the Plymouth Institution. It also recorded features of the original lecture hall, including the president's chair and the frieze. There are question marks over some of the people included. George Whittock, the architect and partner of John Fulston, may not have arrived in Plymouth until later. The Reverend Thomas Burt had left the borough in 1825. However, we should be grateful that so many of those who took part in the establishment of the institution are included in such a grand picture. Ball's painting, interestingly, lacks a portrait or portrayal of an important member of the Duke's party, Admiralty civil servant John Barrow. Barrow not only opposed the adoption of Snow Harris's lightning conductor system, but he doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to have made many friends at the Athenaeum either. Walcombe, in his journal, recorded that Barrow expressed to one of the founder members, Reverend Lampen, that he was astonished to find such an institution in Plymouth. That, no doubt, went down rather badly with the members present. Barrow did express an interest in the museum and said that he would send material for it. Rather pointedly, Walcombe added a note at a later date in his journal that this was never done. Was all this ill feeling the reason that Barrow was excluded from the painting, or is he the figure whose face has been obliterated behind the shoulder, the right shoulder of the Duke? But to return to William's visit, after leaving the Athenaeum, William proceeded in the Admiral's barge to the Hamoes, where he went on board and inspected the San Joseph. Then he went, he, then he and Adelaide, who had that morning visited the dockyard, went aboard the lightning steamer to inspect the breakwater again. In the evening, their royal highnesses hosted a ball and supper aboard their yacht, the Sovereign, which was joined up with HMS Meteor to accommodate between five and six hundred guests. In the ballroom were two elegant orchestras hung with flags and adorned with evergreens. The neck of the yacht, from stern to about midship, was laid out with long tables upon which was placed a sumptuous collation with the choicest and most costly wines. Dancing to music by the Marine Band didn't commence until around 11pm and supper followed at midnight before dancing was resumed. William and Adelaide had departed on the royal barge from Mount Edgecombe before the party broke up at 2 a.m. At 11 a.m. the following morning, William was on the hoe again to inspect all the troops in the garrison, including the Royal Marines. In the evening, William and Adelaide dined with Commissioner Shield at the dockyard. The following day, Adelaide lunched with Sir John Cameron's wife in the Citadel, while William dined with the officers of the garrison at Elliot's Hotel, Devonport, before attending the regatta ball and gathering of 600 people at the Royal Hotel. On Friday the 20th of July, the Royal couple left Plymouth for Milford Haven, William aboard the Sovereign and Adelaide by land to be reunited at Ilfracombe before heading on to Wales. Before the naming of the Vittling Yard, or sorry, beyond the naming of the Vittling Yard, there were some other legacies and curios from William's time in the three towns. During the visit, Hoxland and Coleman were appointed William's stationers and William Favey, his confectioner. Both were based in 4th Street, Devonport. 
Edward Nettleton, the printer and bookseller, presented a beautiful specimen printing in gold on purple satin to William, who then appointed Nettleton as his, as his printer, giving him permission to bear his royal arms. William presented the committee of the Plymouth Regatta through the Earl of North Esk with a trophy, the Clarence Cup, valued at 50 guineas. William and Adelaide had watched the regatta from the Citadel as a crowd of between 12 and 15,000 gathered for the races. The occasion was celebrated by the formation of the Port of Plymouth Royal Clarence Regatta Club, renamed the Royal Western Yacht Club in 1833. The Plymouth Regatta was first held in 1825, the funds being subscribed by townspeople. The course laid out was twice round the Sound, marker boats being placed at Penley Point and off Staden Heights. It seems the yacht owners taking part in the inaugural event were Captain Lockyer, William Snow Harris and a Mr Fox. According to the Morning Post, William gave a very handsome sum in aid of the erection of that elegant building now in progress, the Freemasons Hall in Cornwall Street. <coughs> However, William's time as Lord High Admiral would be brief. Later that year, on the, 28th, on the 20th of October 1827, Admiral Sir Edward Codrington, interpreting his orders with great freedom, sank the Turkish fleet in the Bay of Navarino during the Greek War of Independence. Codrington's action drew enthusiastic praise from William. However, William hadn't consulted with the High Admiral's Council before making public comments which did not reflect government policy. In January 1828, after the Duke of Wellington had become Prime Minister, Navarino was described as an untoward event in the King's speech and Codrington, who would go on to serve as MP for Devonport from 1832 to 39, was recalled and dismissed. Further problems followed in July of 1828. The High Admiral's Council objected to the terms of reference William had given to his commission on naval gunnery. William disregarded their objections, but they secured cabinet support for their complaint. William demanded the dismissal of Sir George Coburn, the senior council member, but Wellington would not oblige, as it would probably have resulted in the resignation of other members of the council. George IV, supporting Wellington, wrote to William saying he must give way. After failed attempts to broker a truce, on the 31st of July, William, back in Plymouth, commandeered a small squadron which was due to go out on manoeuvres and sailed off into the unknown on HMS Britannia. With no one knowing where he had gone and apparently near to a breakdown, William and squadron spent 10 unauthorised days at sea. Wellington, despite George IV's doubts, forced William's resignation in late August 1828. It is said William bore no grudges against Coburn or William, or sorry, or Wellington. He strongly supported the latter's Catholic Emancipation Bill through Parliament, although it has been suggested his motives were inspired as much by his dislike of one of the bill's staunch opponents his ultra-Tory brother, the Duke of Cumberland, as due to his fair-mindedness and liberalism. Despite such willful disregard for orders and protocol, some of William's reforms were much needed. William commissioned the Navy's first steam vessel and advocated the construction of more. He required regular reports on the condition and preparedness um, of each ship and was rightly worried about the state of the Navy's gunnery. He also showed his humanity by abolishing the cat and nine tails as punishment for most offences other than mutiny. As Lord High Admiral, Williams learned some vital, if painful, lessons which would serve him well when he became king on the need to act constitutionally. William became the heir presumptive at the age of 61 when his second eldest brother, Frederick, Duke of York, died in January 1827. 
He became king when George IV died on the 26th of June, 1830. He succeeded to the throne of the United Kingdom at the age of 64, the oldest person to become monarch until Charles III in 2022. He also became the king of Hanover. The coronation of William IV, which was held in Westminster Abbey, took place on the 8th of September 1831, more than 14 months after he became king. William, who disliked ostentation and pageantry, had not wanted to hold a coronation. This was the king who tried to persuade the commons and lords to take over Buckingham Palace when the Houses of Parliament burned down in 1834. Despite refusing to reside at Buckingham Palace, William's proposal was unsuccessful, as was his attempt to refuse coronation. Despite, ref uh, sorry, eventually he was persuaded it was a constitutional necessity. He proceeded, but it was a very low key event compared to his brother, George IV's. William spent just £30,000, around £2.7 five million pounds today compared to George the fourth's 240,000 pounds that's around 22 million pounds today it led the outraged Tories to dub it the half crown nation politically his reign was dominated by the reform crisis after the Duke of Wellington's Tory government lost the August 1830 general election, Earl Grey's Whigs took power with a pledge to enact parliamentary reform. They won a further election in 1831 and then pushed through a reform bill against the opposition of the Tories and the House of Lords, threatening to create 50 new peers to overcome resistance in the Lords. The failure of the Tories to form an alternative government in 1832 meant that William eventually signed the Great Reform Bill. The, Re the Reform Act abolished some of the worst abuses of the, electrical, sorry, of the electoral system, such as the rotten boroughs, and established standardised rules for the franchise. And extending the franchise to the middle classes, even if only to a limited extent, the role of public opinion in the political process was greatly increased. And appropriately, on this day of local elections in the United Kingdom, the, Muni the Municipal Corporations Act of 1835 saw councillors and then ultimately mayors elected to their positions for the first time. His reign also saw a number of other significant reforms passed. The Factory Act of 1833, which improved working conditions for child labour. The Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 and the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834. William, as king, was reconciled to the concept of limited monarchy, although he remains the last British monarch to appoint a prime minister, Robert Peel in 1834, in opposition to the wishes of Parliament. Despite this, he once said, I have my view of things and I tell them to my ministers. If they do not adopt them, I cannot help it. I have done my duty. Although William didn't have any legitimate heirs to the throne, he has a number of notable descendants through his relationship with Dorothea Bland. These include former Prime Minister David Cameron, TV presenter Adam Hart Davis and politician Alfred Duff Cooper, a Conservative cabinet minister in the 1930s and 40s and ambassador to France from 1948 to, sorry, 1944 to 48. Cameron aside, perhaps his most proactive constitutional act was to ensure he lived long enough to see his niece, Victoria, inherit the throne without the requirement of a regency. William knew that his sister-in-law, the Duchess of Kent, hoped Victoria would inherit the throne before the age of 18 so that she could act as regent. William and Adelaide had tried to forge a close relationship with Victoria, but this was thwarted by William's fractious relationship with her mother. The Duchess of Kent, who had great distaste for William's illegitimate children, enforced what was known as the Kensington system on Victoria, preventing her from having contact with anyone the Duchess considered undesirable. This included most of the late father's family. 
William doubted the Duchess's ability to be regent and was suspicious of the influence of her controller, Sir John Conroy, who was also rumoured to be her lover. As his, at his final birthday banquet in August 1836, William told those assembled, which included the Duchess and Victoria, that I trust God that my life may be spared for nine months longer. I should then have the satisfaction of leaving the exercise of the royal authority to the personal authority of that young lady, heiress presumptive to the crown, and not in the hands of a person now near me, who is surrounded by evil advisers and is herself incompetent to act with propriety in the situation in which she would be placed. This William achieved. This William achieved. Victoria reached 18 on the 24th of May 1837, and William died on the 20th of June at Windsor Castle, just under a month after his niece came of age. William, who has been described as the least obnoxious Hanoverian, is regarded as a statesman of integrity, but obstinate and prone to verbal outbursts and temper. He saw action at sea from a young age, a brief but interesting period as Lord High Admiral, and a seven-year reign as the King of the United Kingdom, during which some of the most significant legislation of the 19th century, such as the Reform Act and the abolition of slavery, was passed. His legacy also stretched into the 21st century through the descendants of his children with Dorothea Jordan, most notably in former Prime Minister David Cameron. Williams is often a forgotten reign, but much that happened during it still shapes our lives today. Thank you. Thank you.